Hi guys, it's Glenn from Mud Flood Australia. I just got another video to talk about a very interesting image I got from Campbell's autodidactic video. It's one of his um, more recent videos from a few days ago. And he was going through many images of Sydney uh, and Tartarian Sydney is referring to and one of them was the doors battery of, of uh, Fort Macquarie um, and here's an image of it here and it's on like Miller's Point uh, where it's in the northern part of, uh, of Sydney Cove and we've got an image here and what's what struck me as so I looked at it going okay this is this is quite unusual uh, the image is apparently from a book of watercolors from around 1840s which we'll take a look at in a sec what I drew my attention was this flag here. So, and there's another flag in the background, of course, um, which we can't make out. Uh, you'll see these tall ships, stand three masters. Nothing particularly amazing about these. We'll talk about it a bit later on. Um, and this is supposed to be from the 1840s. Well, that flag is can only be interpreted as a Scottish red ensign flag here it is except uh, there's no white stripe there you see some kind of white stripe that could just be the artist's uh, um, pace to getting it done it's, who knows but anyway that's the that's the uh, uh, Royal Scots Navy red ensign flag of the era or earlier probably around the 18 early 1800s which makes more sense to me. Okay, now let's look at this a bit more. You see, um, you see a, a, a sort of a, a castle or something, or government house or something in the background here. Um, that's probably something we need to think about a bit further. There's a couple of um, typical you know, colonial style two story buildings, and there's not many buildings here at all. But when you look at uh, things from the 1840s, I've got uh, some images here. Uh, let's have a look. Sorry, I'm a bit away from the place about it. Uh, here we go. Uh, maybe it's here. Maybe. Sorry. All right. Here's a watercolor from 1842. Um, what what you see here is much more built out. The the ships here are a little bit more complicated. Like it's not just your simple uh, mast ships. I mean, in in by the 1840s. You're almost verging on some um, you know, steam and sail. Um, now, the, what's interesting about the watercolor image here is that it's done from inside the actual township, uh, and if things are in English. Now, that is what you'd normally get from about the 1830s onwards. Is that art was done within, not without. If you ever go through all the art images, you could look at several. Uh, um, No matter how many you look at, generally, if you look at Le Sur, which is a French uh, botanist uh, from 1802, I think it was, that went around as a, in the French uh, voyage with Bowden, he would generally do Sydney Cove from outside of Sydney itself. It wouldn't be within the township. You wouldn't get something like this where you're in with the people. You'd be out there painting from where you are safe. You weren't allowed in the township, is what I can tell. Um, and a lot of things that I read about the historians of the period is that people like um, John Hunter and so forth, they never wrote about life in Sydney Cove, in Circular Quay, in the new Sydney town. They'd write like, we sailed in, we saw this boat, and then we had to go out to Parramatta to see Governor Philip or something. And they never wrote in situ. They always wrote round about and they never mentioned the the actual township and it looked like it was by design it's very interesting all right so that's what that's what that um, image brought up next thing we need to go through is that this image has quite a lot to cover okay as you can see here there's water this is not what Dwarf's Point is Dwarf's Point's on land you think that you get a battery like this on the land but there's water here now, that's a bit strange. How do you flood? How do you flood a 
um, a Port Jackson. I mean, how does a Port Jackson flood? Well, I don't know. I've got, a, I've got a, some ideas to talk about. One is uh, an article, uh, or a paper written um, in 1969, and so there's probably some good stuff here. Well, they discussed the Hawkesbury River floods uh, in 1801 and 1806, and 1809, this is 1809's interesting, because we know that we start getting into more mud floods around 1812 to 1816 around the Northern Hemisphere, but we have quite a lot of uh, intense weather. It goes into a huge amount of information about the colonies at the time, which is quite amazing how fast the colonies uh, became more powerful with lots of landholders and lots of incredible things going on in just a matter of a few years of the first ship turning up. It's quite interesting how there's so much activity all of a sudden. Anyway, move on. Uh, one of the th next thing is that we probably need to think of Sydney being a um, being a place that essentially was probably Scottish uh, or, or um, one of the interesting things about uh, about Sydney is that Arthur Philip referred to it as New Albion as on approach to Sydney. He didn't refer to it as uh, Sydney. Well, he didn't refer to it as anything else. New Albion. So, yeah, if you go back to the idea of New Albion, there's a, I wanted to show you something here. Uh, sorry, I have to scroll through and find out. Um, Francis Drake was obviously a famous explorer of the 1500s and he said, oh, I found this place called New Albion, it's a Scottish territory. Oh, it's amazingly, uh, it's, in, it's in California or something, that's what he said it was. And here is an, is a, an image of apparently where New Albion was, which apparently tees up with it possibly being in San Francisco. Here's their cartographer's image of the coast, it could well have been anywhere but that you know I don't see it being necessarily California-esque it kind of could be and here is a close-up I don't know if it's true or not but the thing is is that New Albion was always it could have been several New Albions in fact uh, New Nova Scotia in in um, northeast uh, North America is obviously another option no, you have places that are called Nova Scotia, and they have places like Dunedin in, in South Island, New Zealand. These places are Scottish revival co colonies that we don't necessarily talk about. It's quite likely that they were colonies set up at the Scot, the Kingdom of Scotland did attempt to set up uh, as, uh, uh, colonies under their own sovereign, quite a few places, but none of those places um, mention New Zealand and Australia so we that's probably been wiped off history just sort of mention that um, so another interesting thing is this thing called the Irish rebellion of 1788 um, it's it 1798 sorry now okay led by Presbyterians angry at being shut out of the power by the Anglican establishment and joined by Catholics, etc. So there's, there's apparently these Irish people just had had enough, and, and even though there was part of a big, broader, united Irishman, which is apparently a substantial political movement that occurred in the end of the uh, 18th century, it's just they just say that there was just a, uh, the Irish uprising that happened in Australia in Vinegar Hill. There's a close-up image of it, I think. This is a cartoon of it done in the 1800s, um, retrospectively. So the artist, his name is uh, George Cruikshank. It obviously wasn't of the period, it was a bit after. as a caricature from his p belief of what the actual war would have looked like. Well, what you can see here is that these are apparently supposed to be convicts that are Irish and just a whole bunch of hooligans. And here's the noble, wonderful British that started the lands in the first place. Well, let's look at it, they've got They've got guys on a horse. If you ever have someone on a horse, they're a noble person or someone of, of power. There's no way convicts would have even a tent of this size. That's obviously a, a bell and a flag. Then no convicts would have been like this. Cannons? Is this the Irish cannons? Is this the British? What is this? You see, yes, they fought with swords and stuff, but they also had rifles. Here's an, 
This is from um, apparently from 1798, but as you can see, it was the cartoon was 1845, so not too far off. The another battle was the Castle Hill Uprising. Let's see if I can find an image of it. Sorry, I'm dancing around a bit. Okay, this is the Convict Uprising of 1804 on Vinegar Hill, which was an extension of the Irish Uprising. So. This there's are called convicts, and here I, c I don't have a decent high res image, but basically they're the British on the left, and over here is the fairly well dressed, standard dressed, everyday dressed. They have, they, uh, they, they have lots of swords. I think there's a few of rifles, but they're generally mainly swords. I, convicts can't get swords; they always have picks and shovels at best. So I think I look at the massive numbers, and this is only 1804. So, I and here's if this this I'm assuming a couple of these um, noble people are representing the convicts, so they're well dressed, so they're probably the leaders of the original colonists, which I'm assuming were Irish and Scottish and Gaelic and English and French and whoever. So here they are. They're the they're the people that originally colonised, and here's the British coming in probably doing some kind of scam to get their way to set up a war which they'd win. Then they called them all convicts, they were like convicts to me. And this was this Im this this um, this watercolour was done close to the period, I don't know exactly what time it was. I think it was actually done at the period of 1804. I'm not sure. Okay, so obviously we've got a problem with the narrative. Um, so another thing I wanted to talk about is this issue with floods. Um, the concept is is that perhaps perhaps Port Jackson flooded I mean it can flood for a short period of time though of course it levels out to the sea you can have um, uh, you can have super tides occasionally but if you go back to the image it's here clearly flooded is it possible well, floods, and this is an interesting thing. I wanted to, to just add this. I go through the floods on Wikipedia. Yeah, it's not, not that I want to use Wikipedia. Anyway, it, what I, th I think I caught it out here. Here we go. 1806, Melbourne, there was a big flood. And there was, a, you know, there was no state of Victoria. So it's New South Wales, Great New South Wales. A citation is needed. Of course it is, because when you look at the history of Melbourne, there was no there was no one there at 1806. In fact, there was a short um, settlement in 1803. There we go, short-lived settlement. October 1803 and 1804, they got to go to Tasmania or Van Diemen's Land, and of course, through the 1810s and 1820s, Port Phillip was regularly visited by whalers and sealers who worked from the coast. Well, obviously if they visited they must have stopped somewhere and had meat or beer or rum or you know, wine and whiskey and music entertainment. Because they had to be a port there surely. And therefore Shantytown. Therefore that is the first settlement. That's Melbourne, I'm assuming. Whatever it was called. I guess it was called Port Phillip or Port something. We could probably find that out eventually. So let's go back to the image that I started on. So I know I'm going around and around about. Okay, so what do we know? That's the um, Scottish uh, red ensign flag. It's, it's got water here. It could be by design. It could be a particular high tide. I don't know. It's not particularly densely populated. It's got standard old ships. There's nothing fancy here. You could probably look at that small boat and that skiff uh, 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 and see what, roughly what if that had, you could date that you could go to the actual book itself where these come from it's quite a complicated book um, I was looking through it it's actually a manuscript now this is the back cover and there's also a front cover the manuscript has several oh, sorry it might take a while to actually work Okay. Okay. Here is the marble work of the back image, and the front cover is the same. This is uh, marbling, which is fairly common 
in the 1800s and all the way through the 1800s. So it's saying it's from 1840 is possible, it's saying it's from 1820 is possible. But we don't, I don't think that this image is from 1840 to 1850 as, the, as it says in the library in the reference. Because there's not enough people. Because the because a typical watercolour of the era has more buildings and has more involved, there's more stuff, there's, there, there's dense things are cut out, things are clear, there's less green, it's dirtier, the ships are more robust, you usually are on the inside and everything kind of makes sense in a way. Okay, That's what it's like, so I don't think it's that, I think it's earlier. Now it's probably during a heavy flood phase. It makes it makes sense. It's before the 1820s when the you know, the 1830s, particularly that when government when the modern government house was being conceived by the British, and the 1820s when you started getting more British um, control. So it's obviously in the first 20 years. I'd say somewhere between 1790 and 1815 or something. So that would make more sense. And you have a Scottish flag, which could it was Kingdom of Scotland. It could be related to the Kingdom of Ireland as well somehow. Um, Scotland, it's probably an interesting history. Well, I don't have enough graphics to show you. But in the mid-1700s, uh, the Kingdom of Scotland did fall apart and it was transferred over through treaty to, um, to, to, to the, you know, the British Empire, I suppose. Uh, but that doesn't mean the colonies stopped. I mean, I can imagine that the colonies would have they would have left and tried to set up a new kingdom elsewhere to get away from the British and regroup and start again and try to start in their own land and say, well, we're Scotland here. This is new Albion, new Nova Scotia, Dunedin, you know, or whatever. You know, um, Glen Innes is a Scottish place name. There's a castle there, apparently. So, you can, and then the Irish would have had the same problem, then setting up their own colonies, saying, well, we've got money, we've got ships, let's go somewhere else and just start again. You know, and of course it would have, wouldn't have, would not have taken them long to get the resources and the power through having fresh land and a fresh kingdom. It makes sense for them to want to regroup. And that's, that's how you would end up with massive amounts of soldiers, uh, sorry, here, where you get a scene where you have well-armed Irish here, uh, way above the narrative, they are not convicts. So the fundamental theory is this. Um, I, have no, I do not have any evidence that Sydney Cove was a British settlement. In the, as they say it is, I think that from 1788 they just moved to Parramatta, that's the only place where the British could set up an office and that's where they set up, where they incorporated the office of, of you know, the Sydney office basically, of the British East India Trading Company. From there they, uh, they would have subverted the powers operating in Sydney Cove and anywhere else in Sydney, most likely in North Sydney. I don't see why you would set up in Paramount. If you were a British fleet, the first fleet, you'd probably go somewhere like Middle Cove or or you know, there's a whole bunch of places I could think that's better than Parramatta. It was a bit swampy, I think, apparently. Um, so I think that I think it's an odd choice that they did that. There is no reference to them being a Sydney Cove, really, uh, that I think is credible. And I think that the Kingdom of Scotland was you know, attempting to build something greater power, and that's been wiped out of history. So hopefully that's been helpful. I thank you, Campbell from Autodidactic, who. Um, gave uh, to um, made me aware of this and I look forward to getting any feedback so thanks very much <laughs>